Good morning from Ford City, Pennsylvania on Sunday, October the 4th, 2020. This is Chuck King bringing you the daily Bible study from Luke 11. And we're only going to do the first part of this chapter today. Luke 11, beginning in verse 1. Let's pray for the folks who we know who are sick today. Father, we thank you for the mercy and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have promised to never leave us or forsake us, that you'll be with us to the very end of the age. And we depend on you and your power and strength because we are so weak. And today we remember those who are sick among us. We think of President Trump and his wife, Melania, and all those surrounding him from his administration who have uh, gotten the virus and are sick right now. We ask you, Lord, to bring healing and deliverance to each one of them. Hear our cries, O God. Save them from this sickness and restore them to complete health. We ask this for people, our own friends that we know. I pray for Sherry and uh, Sherry, both of my dear friend Sherry's, who are recovering right now in Jesus' name. You would raise them up, deliver them totally from any kind of sickness related to the COVID attack in Jesus' name for Sister Mortimer in Jesus' name, that she would fully recover for your glory and honor. And Lord, all those others who we don't know, we're asking that you would have mercy on all the people who are struggling, not only here, but around the world facing this COVID virus. Lord, deliver us. We need your power to deliver us. We wait upon you today to do so and to heal the sick for, for any reason that they're facing today in weakness in their bodies. We know you've called us to pray for one another and to go and heal the sick in Jesus' name. And we lift up the name and the blood of Jesus Christ as victory over all of our problems. Protect us and deliver us. We ask it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to look at Luke chapter 11, verse 1. Now it came to pass... As he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. So they were observing, his disciples were observing him praying. And when he was finished, one of those disciples asked him if he could teach them how to pray. And Jesus did, verse 2. So he said to them, when you pray, say... So it's important to, to speak out, to confess the prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, this is an important introduction to our prayer. We, we focus our prayers to our heavenly Father, just like Jesus did. He has taught us to pray to the Father in his name. And so we exalt the name of the Lord and his kingdom and pray and declare that his kingdom would come and his will would be done not only in heaven, but also here on earth. This is the, the way we should pray for the will of God. This is all Jesus ever intended to do was to come to do the will of the Father in word and deed. And we should be the same. Verse 3, give us day by day our daily bread. So Jesus is teaching us to ask the Father every day to provide for our basic needs. Verse 4, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us or, or who has sinned against us. So we should, we should ask the Lord to forgive us of our sins. This is how he taught us to pray. It's important that we always realize how weak we are and we need his forgiveness. And we also need to forgive everyone who sins against us. It's so important. It's basic, but it's crucial that we would forgive everyone in order to be forgiven. 
And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So Jesus teaches us not to seek trials and testings, but to ask the Father not to lead us into those testings and trials and temptations, but rather to deliver us from the evil one. The temptations come from the evil one. God is not capable of being tempted or tempting anyone. It's the evil one that works this process of deception and temptation against us. So we should pray this way. It's a simple prayer. It doesn't take a lot of time. And then he goes on, verse 5. And he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. So he gives us a, a parable or an illustration of how this friend went to another friend at midnight and asked for three loaves of bread. Why? Because someone stopped on a journey, stopped into their house to, to visit or to stay over, and they had no food to give him. Verse 7, And he will answer from within and say, do not trouble me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. So the person that he was seeking the loaves of bread from resisted it because it was inconvenient. He was already in bed, and his family was in bed, and he, he didn't want to get up and give his friend the bread for his visitor. Verse 8. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. So here Jesus is saying that it's, it's not even the relationship or the friendship that this person had with the one from whom he was seeking bread. It wasn't that relationship that would motivate him to actually get out of bed and give him the bread, but it was the persistence of the person asking and asking and asking and seeking the bread for his visitor. It's that persistence that would cause the person to get up and give him the loaves. Very interesting teaching. And so that's to be our attitude in prayer that we should, we should not just assume because of our relationship with the Lord that he will immediately respond, but that we should keep seeking him with persistence. Verse 9, so I say to you, this goes right along with the same teaching here on prayer, so I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. And there's that, we, we know by now that that form of the verb means to keep on asking seek and you will find and that means keep on seeking and you will find and knock and it will be open to you keep on knocking so it's not a one time prayer but a, a, a prayer that is persistent verse 10 for everyone who asks and implied here is keep on asking receives or until you receive you keep asking and he who seeks finds, that implies he keeps on seeking until he finds it. And to him who knocks or keep on knocking until he finds it, it will be opened. Verse 11, if a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? So if a child asks his father for something to eat, he wouldn't give him a stone instead. Or if he asks for a fish, we give him a serpent instead of a fish. You know, a parent wouldn't do that to give their children something bad for them. Verse 12, or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? Of course, the answer is no. Now look at verse 13. 
If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So he compares our our parental love for our children, and imperfect as we are, and he, he uses the term being evil here. It's quite a contrast between us and God. Compared to God, we are certainly uh, considered as he said, being evil. We know how to take care of our children, giving them good gifts. So how much more will our glorious, loving, perfect Heavenly Father provide for those who ask him? And it says here, the Holy Spirit, to those who ask him. And isn't that the greatest need we have? The power and the grace of the Holy Spirit. So the Heavenly Father, when we ask him, that's how we began, teach us to pray. And Jesus taught them to seek the Heavenly Father for for the answers to their prayers and to keep on asking and keep on seeking and keep on knocking. So this is the teaching that Jesus is giving here, a persistent prayer life that continues to seek the Father for the needs of in our lives. Verse 14, and he was casting out a demon and it was mute. So it was when the demon had gone out that the mute spoke and the multitudes marveled. So now we immediately see uh, one of the, the, the ministry situations where Jesus cast out a demon and it says here it was caused a person to be mute. And the demon left and that person who was mute spoke, and everybody marveled at that, and everybody constantly marveled at the power of Jesus Christ. Verse 15, but some of them said, he casts out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. So what they're, the critics, the hypocrites, the, the enemies of Jesus are falsely claiming that Jesus casted out demons by the power of evil, by the power of the devil. Verse 16, others testing him sought from him a sign from heaven. So there, there were always mixed in the multitude of the crowd that he was ministering to, these religious hypocrites and opposition and enemies of Jesus who were either accused him falsely, in this case of casting out demons by the power of the devil or uh, demanding more signs from heaven to prove he was the Messiah. He did so many things right before their eyes that no one could ever doubt that he was the Son of God, the Messiah. Yet they kept asking, testing him for more signs. Verse 17, but he knowing their thoughts, he knew their thoughts, even though they didn't speak these things out. Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, knew what they were thinking. And he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation or destruction. And a house divided against a house falls. So he begins, answers them and their criticisms and their, their begging for a sign and their false accusations, he talks about a divided kingdom, that a kingdom can't stand if it's divided, and a house can't, a household can't uh, stand if it's divided. Verse 18, if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebub. So Jesus is saying the devil's kingdom is not divided. He couldn't be effective in his work of wreaking havoc on the earth among the people. His kingdom couldn't continue. And they were, they were saying that Jesus cast out demons by the power of the devil, which would mean that the one demon's pit against another. So that, is, that it wasn't the case. Verse 19, and if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. 
there were Jews who were casting out demons out of people uh, before the ministry of Jesus. And, and of course, his disciples were casting them out. And uh, so Jesus is saying, uh, you know, if, 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 if I cast out demons by the power of devil, what about those who you approve of that are casting out demons? And he said, they'll be your judges for, their, for this foolish and lying accusation against Jesus Christ. Verse 20, but if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. So Jesus is telling them, I do this by the power of God, and his kingdom is being manifested right before you, even if you try to lie and say that it isn't true. When a strong man, Jesus said, when a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. So when you protect what God has given you as a good steward, no one can steal them. When your your goods or your your uh, possessions. But verse twenty two says, but when a stronger then he comes upon him and overcomes him. He takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. So Jesus is talking about someone forcefully stronger than you coming and stealing all of your defenses and taking what you have. Verse 23, he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Now, remember when Jesus rebuked his disciples for trying to stop someone from casting out demons in his name, and he he told them, hey, if they're not against me, they're for me. They can't do this and ever say anything bad about me. But here, the opposite end of this is that these hypocritical Jews who who were lying and accusing Jesus of being empowered by the devil when he cast out demons, he's telling his disciples, that these kinds of people that are blaspheming against the Holy Spirit are against him. They are not with him. And if if you don't help him do the work of the kingdom, if you don't gather with him, you are scattering, you're causing division. Verse 24, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man... He goes through dry places seeking rest and finding none. He says, I will return to my house from which I came. So now he describes and really giving us revelation on uh, on demons. We know very little about them and how they operate. But Jesus said, when a demon is cast out, it, it tries to find a place of rest. In other words, somewhere else to live. We know they try to live in people. They try to live in can live in animals. We know that. And if he can find nowhere to go, uh, the demon says, I'm going to return to that person that I was cast out of. I will return to my house from which I came. Speaking of the person that he left. Verse 25. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. So the demon was cast out and it comes back and finds that there's no way or no reason for it to get in again. But verse 26 gives us understanding what they do. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. So the when the demon can't get into a person because they've been cleansed, or put in order, it goes and finds seven other more powerful or more wicked than himself, which tells you there are different different um, grades or um, varieties of demons, more or less wicked, and they force their way back in into that man that was delivered. And then he's worse off than he was at first. Now, uh, we don't know a lot about this, but we know 
that demons will try to counterattack. Once they've been cast out, they will try to get back in. That's why it's so important for the individual who has a demon cast out of them to be prepared to resist and to walk in the spirit, to follow Jesus as a disciple and so that the demon won't find any way it can get back in or even bring more powerful demons to get back in. But if you cast a demon out of someone who's not prepared to, uh, to follow Jesus, to keep their house clean, or to resist the devil so that it, the, the devil will flee from him, he could get uh, a situation where even more powerful demons could come and possess him and make him worse than he was when he only had the one demon. That's what he's saying here. We don't understand all of this, but we know how important it is not to fool around with demons or or to assume that we can just cast out demons out of anyone and they'll be fine because if they're not prepared to follow Jesus, that following Jesus or committing your life to Jesus will give you the protection and the power you need to resist the devil the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. But if you don't serve him and if you fool around with sin again, you can find yourselves in really bad shape, worse off. Like the scripture says, you'd be better off if you never knew him than to know him and then to turn back and forsake the Lord. It's like a dog returning to his vomit. Or a pig having been washed, turning back to the mud hole. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna stop there, uh, uh, and then we will take a couple more verses, twenty seven and twenty eight. Then we'll quit. And it happened as he spoke these things that a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, "Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts which nursed you." So. As he's teaching, someone, a woman yelled out uh, this this statement, uh, blessing his mother, and and that she nursed him. Verse twenty eight. Here's here's a remarkable statement by Jesus, and it's the word of God. But he said to them, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. So the the priority of hearing and obeying the word is a greater blessing than than being a, a parent of the Messiah, to, of the, being the mother of the Messiah. How important it is to hear and obey the word, to be part of the family of God. So we'll stop there today on this Sunday morning, and we'll finish this a longer chapter. We'll begin in verse 29 tomorrow. So again in Luke 11, we, we get insight on prayer. How do we pray? Jesus taught us how to pray. Simply, not long extended prayers, but to glorify the Father and to seek him for his daily provision and confessing and our sins to be forgiven, forgiven, forgiving everyone else and praying that we're not led into testing, but delivered from the evil one. So resisting the devil is part of our prayer time. And uh, then he talked, taught them about the persistent prayer, the need to ask and seek and knock and keep on doing so by persistence until we get the answers to our prayers. And because our Father in heaven will certainly give us the Holy Spirit when we ask him. He's, he is much kinder and better to us than our earthly parents could ever be. Then the teaching on the divided house. The kingdom of God cannot be divided or else it cannot be successful. And these hypocritical, lying Jewish leaders accused Jesus of casting out demons by the power of Satan, and he had to clearly rebuke them for that and declare to the crowds that these people were against him and scatter instead of gathering with him. And then this insight 
on uh, what happens when a demon's cast out and the importance of for, uh, preventing these these seven other demons from coming back in on a counterattack. We need to be walking with the Lord and resisting the devil so that we don't end up worse off than we were before. And then the, the need to hear and obey the word of God to be part of his family. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the word of God today, for hearing our prayers as we lift up the needs of others, and for seeking you in your word to be washed by the water of the word and to have our faith increased as the word of God teaches us. So we're here as your servants today, thanking you, Lord, for hearing us and being with us as you have promised even to the end of the age. And we glorify and exalt you and thank you and ask you, Lord, and seek you and knock uh, on your door, Father, that you would deliver us from evil that you would deliver us from testing. And may your name be glorified as you provide for us every day. And we exalt you, Lord. Thank you for, for forgiving us all of our sins. And we forgive everyone, Lord. We release them in Jesus' name for your glory and honor. And we exalt and magnify you for who you are and trust you that your kingdom will come and your will will be done today in our lives. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, it was another good study in Luke 11. We'll continue on and finish the chapter tomorrow. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Remember that you are saved by faith and grace, and he will work as you seek him. You will find him and experience the glory of God. Please share the teachings when you see them. We'll see you tomorrow.